Well, thanks for joining me again, or as I often say, letting me join you. Uh, it's good to be in your home. It's good to be able to share something of the truth of Scripture. And as we are doing now on a regular basis, we're going to have a look at Psalm. Today we're looking at Psalm 49. And then we're going to have a story about a man who stands out on the page of Scottish history, a man called Samuel Rutherford. And then we're going to go and look at one of the characters in John's Gospel. And we talked about his sisters last week, but we're going to think about Lazarus today. So let me just turn this music down a little bit. And uh, hopefully when we get to the end of our recording, we'll be able to get the music going again. I think I've failed on the last two occasions, but hopefully I'll get it working this time. So let's go and look at a psalm together. Psalm 49, if you have got your Bible handy. Let me read it to you. Hear this, all ye people. Give ear, all ye inhabitants of the world. Bow low and high, rich and poor, together. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. I will incline mine ear to a parable. I will open my dark saying upon the harp. Wherefore should I fear in the days of evil, when the iniquity of my heel shall compass me about? They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth for ever. Then let me read a little further down in verse 15. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Selah. Now this is another lovely psalm. It's a psalm for the sons of Korah. And I just want to pick up a couple of things that will hopefully encourage you today from this psalm. First of all, you'll notice the psalm is for everybody. Hear this, all ye people. God's word is for everyone and it has a particular relevance to everyone who's a believer, those who love the Lord Jesus. Hear this, all ye people. Give ear, all ye inhabitants of the world. Now, this is a message that is for the whole world. And if we were to go through this line by line, we would realise why it's for the whole world, because it's telling us about people dying and it's telling us that you can die in the Lord. You can die well, so to speak. I know that isn't um, those two things really in one sense. You don't think of them together, dying well. But you can. You can be ready. Uh, you can be prepared. The tragedy of this psalm is if we were to go through every one of the clauses, we would discover that there are people who are not ready to die. We would discover there's people who are depending on their wealth for their future. And they think that they can buy everything and they think that there's nothing that they cannot handle or cope with in this life right to the end because of their wealth. I'll come back to that. But I want you to notice that this is for people no matter their status, high or low, rich and poor together. There is a little phrase in the Bible that's sometimes misunderstood and it says this, God is no respecter of persons. Now that doesn't mean that God has no courtesy or no respect or no, he doesn't take different people into consideration. It, it really simply means he doesn't treat one person differently from another. But listen to the second thing in this psalm. The psalmist says, my mouth shall speak of wisdom and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. There is a little hint in the psalm as to parables and how they should be used and how the Lord Jesus would use them in the days of his ministry upon earth. But you'll notice the psalmist is saying, my mouth shall speak of wisdom and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. Isn't that a lovely thing that when you pick up the Bible, you're assured that it is wisdom that you're reading. This is one of the five wisdom books of the Old Testament. That the psalmist is speaking about wisdom 
that he speaks about and the meditation of his heart, that which he considers within his heart and mind, that which he ponders upon. He says, the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. That's something a Christian can enjoy. Um, we have been given all things that are appropriate, that pertain to life and godliness, Peter writes in his second letter. We've been brought into the knowledge of God and we now have the knowledge of the truth. And we are being given spiritual understanding, an understanding of the things of God through his word. Now, the two things I just want to talk to you about for the remaining couple of minutes on our psalm is verse 7 and verse 15. When he's talking about those who think that their riches are sufficient, their wealth and all that they've achieved is sufficient in itself to clear them and to keep them right and indeed probably even to handle anything to do with God. He says, none of them can by any means redeem his brother or redeem another nor give to God a ransom for him. And we're learning in those verses the redemption of the soul is precious. And you, you know that if you're a Christian. You know it was the blood of Christ. It's the blood of God's dear son. That was the payment that was required, the holy Lamb without blemish and without spot. That was the price that was required to pay so that we could be clear of our guilt, our debt removed, so that we might have salvation, so that we might know that God loves us and the preciousness of salvation that we have through faith in his name. There is nothing that man can do to redeem himself. But then when you come to verse 15, it says, but God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. He's thinking about the next life. And he's thinking about going into the unseen world. And he's thinking about the, the, the power that seems to be associated with death and, and the victory that death seems to have. And he's reminding us, God will redeem my soul. From the power of the grave. That's because of Calvary. That's because of what the Lord Jesus has done. We come into the New Testament and we read about it many times. But in particular, I love those verses that are found in Ephesians chapter 1. And it says it there, just if I get my eye on the right verse here. It says, in whom, the Lord Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, my story today is about a man called Samuel Rutherford. I'll come back to this little book in a moment, but I have this little book in the desk, or should I say in the drawer beside my bed. It's a book that's called The Loveliness of Christ by Samuel Rutherford, and it is a beautiful little book. But who was Samuel Rutherford? Well, he was born in 1600 in Roxburghshire. Uh, he was educated at Edinburgh University in Scotland, and he became a professor. His life then changed dramatically. He was deeply aware of his own sinfulness, and yet he was also aware of the forgiveness that was offered to him through the gospel. And so he repented of his sin and became a believer. That's vital, isn't it? And if you're listening to me and you've never trusted Christ, you've never enjoyed the blessing of forgiveness that would be a wonderful thing to do to get saved now he was just in his 20s when he got saved but he used to uh, he expressed regret at the fact that he felt he delayed becoming a believer for a long time writing to a friend who had become a christian in his youth uh, in in what we well a lot earlier than than in his 20s he, he said this and remember the language is old-fashioned language Ye have gotten a great advantage in the way to heaven. That ye have started to the gate in the morning. Like a fool as I was, I suffered my son to be high in the heaven and near afternoon before I ever took the gate by the end. He was really saying, you got saved young and I waited till the sun was higher in the sky. You can never get saved too young. I'm feel so privileged I was saved of a boy of as a boy of five. I have an uncle who was saved as a boy of four. And I thank God for how he has preserved me and maintained me and, and helped me even when I failed him many times. It's a wonderful thing. 
Now, he, he then eventually decided that he wanted to become a preacher or as a minister they would have called in the circles he moved in. And he became a minister in the parish of Anworth in Kirkudbridgeshire, if that's the way you say it. He was devoted to his parishioners and he laboured fervently among them. It was said that he was always praying, always preaching, always visiting the sick, always writing and studying. He was a man of great devotion. And to, to think of this is the life that a man that God has called to be devoted to his service should be involved in regular praying and, and preaching and visiting the sick and writing and studying. He did all of these things. And people would travel great distances to, to hear him preach. There was a merchant from England who came and travelled a long way to hear him. And he listened to various preachers at this stage of his life. And later he said this, one had showed me my heart. Another showed me the majesty of God. But when describing Samuel Rutherford, this man said, he showed me the loveliness of Christ. Now that's what this, this book is called, The Loveliness of Christ. For almost two years, he preached. Uh, and then he was ex exiled by the church authorities to Aberdeen. They were silencing his voice. They didn't like what he preached. But they couldn't stop him writing. So he wrote numerous letters at that time. And these letters were rich in spiritual truth. And that's where some of these things that I've got in this little book uh, come from. Now, one of the great preachers of a later day, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, said this. When we are dead and gone, let the world know that Spurgeon held Rutherford's letters to be the nearest thing to inspiration, which can be found in all the writings of mere Men. I want to just read you a little uh, extract from this book and this uh, is a lovely little book uh, and I'm, you can get it from the Banner of Truth Trust in Scotland so there's a little advert for you and uh, he writes some lovely things he said this remember that his life was often under threat he said neither need we fear crosses or sigh or be sad for anything that is on this side of heaven if we have Christ. He said, oh, that we could put our treasure in Christ's hand and give him our gold to keep and our crown. These remember extracts. He said in another occasion, our fair morning is at hand. The day star is near the rising and we're not many miles from home. What matters the ill entertainment in the smoky ends of this miserable life? We are not here to stay and we will be dearly welcome to him whom we go to. He loved the Lord Jesus. He was looking for heaven. When circumstances changed, he was able eventually to return to Anworth. Uh, but then he was persuaded to become professor of divinity in St Andrews. Now, when Charles II came to the throne, Rutherford was deprived of his position and his income. Actually, he was a dying man at this stage. It was a very cruel move of the king. Some One nobleman is noted to have said this. You have voted that honest man out of the college, but you cannot vote him out of heaven. People may take away your privileges and your position, but they can't rob you of what you have in the Lord Jesus. He was ordered to appear before Parliament on the charge of treason. This is what he said. He's on his deathbed by this stage. He said, tell them... I have a summons already from a superior judge and a judiciary and I behove to answer my first summons. Ere your day come, I shall be where few kings and great men come. Is that not true? First Corinthians chapter 1 says, Not many noble, not many mighty. Oh, thank God there are some, but not many. He said, well, I'm going to be where few kings and great men come. He died on 28th of March, 1661. I was born 300 years later, uh, plus about six months. But it <laughs> just struck me there as I was reading that. Among his last words, he said, I shall live and glory, I shall live and adore Christ. Glory to my Redeemer forever. Glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. On his gravestone in St Andrews, his epitaph includes these lines. His learning justly raised his fame. True godliness adored his name. He did converse with things above 
acquainted with Emmanuel's love. For Rutherford, the trials of this world gave way to the triumph of heaven. Isn't that just a wonderful prospect? Emmanuel's land, he loved it. He wrote about it. He wrote that amazing hymn, The Sands of Time Are Sinking. And he spoke about his eyes being on the beloved. It's a wonderful thing to think about. My character today from John's Gospel is the same passage as we read last week, John chapter 11. But I want to talk to you today about Lazarus. He's the man who died. He's the man who Jesus brought back to life. The Lord Jesus, as far as we can tell from Luke's Gospel and from John's Gospel, he loved to go to Bethany. And Lazarus had got sick. Now you might remember some things about Lazarus. I want to just read this, what it says here. The message went out to the Lord Jesus. Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And then, of course, you remember the Lord Jesus waited four days and he eventually goes. And when he arrives, Lazarus is already dead and buried. Let me talk to you about Lazarus just for a moment or two. His name means helped of God. That's a lovely name, isn't it? Lazarus, helped of God. Here's a man that knew God's presence. He'd met the, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus. He'd had the Lord Jesus in his home. That was a wonderful thing. Of course, he's in your home as well. You can know his presence because he guarantees it for those who trust him. He was loved by the Lord Jesus. We read in this passage here. Now Jesus loved Mary, Martha and her sister and Lazarus. He was loved. Mind you, you're loved by the Lord Jesus. He loves you immensely and deeply. He cares for you. We talked about this last week. There may seem to be... It's worrying for the person the Lord didn't come. Because we don't always understand the circumstances at the time. It's maybe worrying for you that you think God hasn't answered your prayer. But remember, his timing is always right. His timing is perfect. He knows exactly what he's doing. As far as they were concerned, he didn't come in time. As far as the Lord Jesus was concerned, his timing was perfect. Because he was going to take this man through the valley of the shadow of death. And then bring him back to life. The sisters would be broken hearted. But they'd discover that God raises the dead. And Jesus is the Son of God. And Jesus raises the dead. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. The Son of the, the Highest. Tremendous, isn't it? He was called. And eventually he came. By the time he came, Lazarus had been dead four days. But here's a wonderful thing. Lazarus went through death, through what the psalmist calls the valley of the shadow of death. But Lazarus also heard the call of the Lord Jesus in resurrection. The Lord Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And he came out and he was loosed from death and he was wrapped in grave clothes and they let him free. That was quite an amazing thing. The people were fascinated, as I would have been, as you would have been, to meet a man who died and he came back to life. In John chapter 12, it says, Then six days before the Passover came to Bethany. Sorry, Jesus, six days before the Passover came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. And they made him a supper. They made a celebratory supper. Maybe not. Maybe it was just a normal, ordinary supper. But the Lord Jesus was there. He was the, the chief guest. He always is. But the Bible tells us much people of the Jews came because they knew that he was there. The Lord Jesus was there. But they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. I see the attention was on the spectacle, not on the saviour. That's the danger of the way the human heart works. We often like the supernatural. We like to see miraculous things. We like to see extraordinary things. If only they had realised it was the Lord Jesus that was the one they should have come to see. He was the most important one that would ever cross their path. Well, that's our little talk over for today. I do trust that God would bless you through his word today. My prayer is that you might enjoy the presence of God in your life and throughout this week. I'll be back with you in a couple of days' time to do another 
little talk. We'll have another story, another passage from the scripture. But I'm just going to now pray and ask God to bless you and be with you as we uh, part one from another for a little while. So let's just let's just pray. Dear God, we give thanks for the time we've spent in thy presence. And we pray, O oh God, that as we have considered Lazarus and as we have considered this great example of Samuel Rutherford and when we think about the teaching of Scripture, we pray it might encourage us. We pray it might lift our spirits. We pray it might help us on our pathway home to heaven. We ask these things in the Lord Jesus' name. Thanks again for joining us. I do trust that you'll have a good week and that God will richly bless you.